Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for, to, for coming to IDS on this terrible rainy evening for our first ever digital and technology cluster evening seminar. Um, I'm uh, Becky Faith, and I co-lead the digital and technology cluster here with my colleague, Tony Roberts, and I'm beyond delighted to welcome Danjala Nayabola as um, our first ever guest talking about digital democracy analog politics, which is available for the bargain price of nine pounds from the back. You and we also have it. a discount code <laughs> yeah. available so you can buy it online. Um, Nanjala is a consultant, policy analyst, author, freelance writer and political commentator for, among others, among others, Foreign Affairs, New African, The Nation, Al Jazeera, The BBC and The Guardian. Mm -hmm. And um, Tony, my colleague, will be kicking off by asking a few questions. And then we'll have some questions from the floor afterwards. And this is being recorded. And I should say, for people who don't know, the fire exits are there and there. But hopefully there won't be a fire. Thank you, Becky. Um, we've just had, we've just recorded a podcast, so I've used up all my best questions. We're, we're left with the dregs, I'm afraid. Um, but hopefully, I'm just going to ask the first two or three questions, and then we're going to, as quickly as you're ready, start taking questions from the floor. Um, I think I probably got the first ever UK copy of this book as soon as it was available from Amazon, and I tore through it inside a week. Um, and was so excited, I started live tweeting <laughs> chapter by chapter as I went through the book. Um, so I, I was very impressed, and I, I'm sure those of you who get to have one of the, the few copies here will, will be equally impressed. Um, so, Nangela, perhaps I can ask you to begin by telling us how long this book was in gestation and what motivated you to write it. Hi, everyone. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes? Okay. Um, yeah, this, this book has been a, a multi-year labor of, um, yeah, okay, let's say love. Um, no, it, it really has been a labor of love um, and a complicated uh, thing as love is. Um, it has its origins in the 2007 post-election violence in Kenya. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the broad contours of that, but for those of us who are Kenyans who were in Kenya, it was really a very decisive political moment, a kind of rupture with the narrative of who Kenya was and what Kenya could be moving forward and, and a real challenge to some of the presumptions that we had about our society. Um, but one of the things that happened um, out of that period was a lot of people, myself included, um, we, we hopped online as a way of telling the story or reading the story, consuming information about the country um, because there was a, a, a wave of censorship of the traditional media on one hand and there was a wave of um, self-censorship as well. Um, and then at the same time, this vacuum, informational vacuum that exists around African countries, you know, where we don't necessarily get high quality attention, if any attention that we get from media from other parts of the world. Um, and especially after the, 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 the emergency period kind of passed, a lot of people, kind of, a lot of media houses kind of moved on to other stories, but we were still living the reality um, of that period. But the third piece of that is, um, by this time there were uh, uh, 2.6 million Kenyans, estimated 2.6 million Kenyans living abroad. Um, most of whom would fall under the category of highly educated, meaning a university degree or above. Um, many of whom were trying, and, and not just in the UK, you, the US, people in Turkey, or people in China, or people in Romania, in Russia, in the Czech Republic, trying to keep up with what was happening in the country and finding that the main media houses in the country didn't have the technology, didn't have the websites that they needed to be able to have real-time information about what was happening in Kenya. And it's out of this vacuum that I argue that um, you start to see things like Ushahidi, for example, which is a crisis mapping app that was built off someone's blog. So Aurea Kola used to run a blog called Kenya Pundit, that's her Twitter handle now. And um, she put up a blog post and said, what if we were able to map in real time what was happening on the ground in Kenya during the emergency period uh, of the post-election violence? And that you know, Eric Hussman and a bunch of other developers come together and say, yeah, actually that's something that we can do, integrate texting to mapping. 
Um, you had websites that concerned Kenyan writers. Um, uh, Kenya Imagine, um, Mashada forums where people were having conversations, real-time conversations about what was happening in Kenya. Some of it was really nasty. I mean, I'm saying this as a participant observer. Some of it was really, really, really nasty, um, replicating what was happening um, in terms of physical violence in the country. But some of it was really amazing. Some of it was people um, challenging the presumptions that because you were ethnic group X, you had to have uh, this opinion about ethnic group Y. And so it was really about speaking up against that sort of vacuum. And my own experience, again, as a participant observer, that's, I started writing in the 2007 election. Um, I was a student in the UK. I went home for the first time, and then my country fell apart and was like, well, this is awkward. Um, so went back to finish my degree with this shifting sense of purpose, of which writing was a very central um, part. And so that's one route. Um, the other route is in graduate school, and, and I'm, I'm guessing there's a lot of graduate students here. Um, I tend to drift into Americanisms quite a bit. Um, but um, in a master's program, um, we, I found it really difficult to tell contemporary stories. I found it very difficult to tell stories about the Kenya that I knew. And I remember this, the, the actual text has its roots in my second master's uh, thesis, which was I wanted to write about how women wrote the 2007 post-election violence. Because the other thing that had happened up to this point was the opinion pages in Kenya are dominated by men. And at the time it was, and you're talking about three articles a day on the daily papers, four on the Saturday, and about 12 on the Sunday. It's not unusual to open a Sunday newspaper in Kenya and find three bylines by a woman, one in sports, one in health and gender issues, and then Rasna Wara in the opinion pages. And now Rasna's gone, so that's gone. Um, you, you, so it was Rasna and Madhoni, Madhoni Wanyaki and Rasna Wara, who were the women who were writing opinion pieces. And I wanted to map that. I wanted to spend my dissertation thesis looking at how, um, my, my master's thesis, sorry, looking at how the internet was providing space for women that the traditional media was denying. And I remember the conversation because my supervisor said, Lanjala, these are middle class concerns. And I thought, but I am middle class. Does that mean that my concerns don't matter? Does that mean that if I don't fall into the stereotypes of or presumptions of who an African is, that my existence is irrelevant? Um, and I've always taken issue with that particular thing because um, it is. I think it is possible to have conversations about Africa that uh, and about urban Africa and about. Um, contemporary Africa that don't necessarily deny the existence of or denigrate the existence of rural Africa. We are Africans also, and our lives and our existences matter. And so really the, 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 the thesis process was, let's say, fraught. Um, and out of that came this feeling of, I'm not done with this project. I'm not done with this story. I'm putting it aside for now, but I'm not done with it. Um, fast forward, um, and I finally, after a long period of time, moved home. And leading up to the 2017 election, sort of processing the election information and the political information and thinking, something fundamental has shifted. This was in 2015, 2016. Something's different from what we were doing in 2007, but some things are also the same. And I want to take time to organize and put all of these things in one place as a starting point for a different conversation. Um, I was thinking about writing a book for a very long time, and I kept asking people, you know, what is the process? And I get this question a lot, so I know where it is. How does one write a book? And, and spoiler alert, you write one word, and then you write the next word, and then you write the word after that. Um, and people, people kept saying, write what you know write what you know. I thought, well, what do I know? Um, and this is where I landed on this, uh, picked it back up again, and, and started to tell this story that I think gets lost in translation um, a lot. That just because 
the people, the Kenyans who are online. You know, Kenya has an estimated population of between 44 and 48 million, depending on who you ask. Just because there are only 8 million Kenyans with accounts on Facebook, doesn't mean that what's happening on Facebook isn't important. Just because there are only 1 million Kenyans on, uh, with accounts on Twitter, doesn't mean that what's happening on Twitter isn't important. What we need to do is to understand the dynamics before they overwhelm the system, which is what we're seeing in Brazil, for example, which is what we're seeing in the UK, which we're seeing in the US, is that if you don't pay attention to the dynamics before they're, they're out of control, then you are chasing, you're constantly trying to um, address issues after the fact without the, the tools that you need to do that. Um, and so really, long story short, that's the, the genesis of this project is both, you know, the feminist mantra, is, it's, a, it's a cliche for a reason, the personal is political, is to find my personal and to find my political and to put those things together and see, well, what's the story, both from an individual level, but also from a community level as a Kenyan in Kenya who has been part of this conversation for so long. So when we're told the story of Facebook and Twitter and Cam uh, Cambridge Analytica, it's always told through the United States and Trump, it's told through the UK and Brexit. But what your book does, um, in a way I hadn't read before, was, was put Kenya at the center of that story. So can you tell us something about how those technologies are currently shaping governance um, and democracy in Kenya? Yeah. Um, I think the changing nature of elections is going to be the number one political issue for everyone, everywhere in the world over the next few years, uh, wherever you are. I think we've for so long um, been operating with this belief that if we can just secure voting, that everything's gonna be okay. And what we're seeing more and more is the influence of money, first of all, and private commercial interests. And we are seeing uh, the influence of technology in how, in political behavior. These are things that we in Kenya have been grappling with since 2007, really, but really intensely since 2013. The companies that are giving you guys sleepless nights, Cambridge Analytica, has been operational in Kenya since 2011 and was influential in the 2013 election, and was field testing a lot of the techniques that were used here and were used in the US in Kenya before they, they, they used them here. They were active in Nigeria in the previous uh, general election in Nigeria. They've been active in South Africa as well. Um, and I, I connect that to the influence of PR. You know, almost every single African president right now retains a Western public relations firm to do lobbying both in London and in DC. Um, you see it in Gabon, you see it in Cameroon, you see it in Kenya. In Kenya, they love British PR firms, so it's um, BTP Harris Partners. Um, and it's a Jubilee, preferred Jubilee uh, client. And what does that mean? It means that companies that have no stake in the outcomes of the electoral process except the financial, are having an outsized influence on how people interact with the political process and on, therefore on political outcomes. So I think it's important for us to remember that the main reason why social media behaves the way it does is advertising. That they want to make it easier to sell you things. They want to understand what you click on what we click on, what we share, what we like, whatever, so that they can sell us things. Should politics be insulated from advertising? Should political behavior, political choices, be a protected class of product that is insulated from what we're seeing with you know, the fact that you can be talking on your phone or messaging someone on WhatsApp and then the product that you're talking about comes up in your advertising? Should your political behavior be insulated from that um, kind of influence? I would argue yes. And I would argue yes because of what we saw in Kenya in 2017 and of what I fear we might see in Nigeria in this year because Nigeria has an election coming up next week. Um, what we saw in Kenya was 
these PR firms crafting very niche messages that respond to the very specific fears of subgroups, targeting these subgroups with these, messaging, with these messages in a way that the regulator could not see, right? So we had, for example, what was the, called the Real Raila campaign, where the messaging was that if the leader of the opposition at the time, Raila Odinga, won the election in Kenya, that um, he would ruin the country, Raila, Lord of War, he would make us all poor, um, babies would be, it was, it was very, very, the, the production value was high, but the messaging was a little bit like, eh. well, I mean, I don't know, I'm not their target audience. Um, this message wasn't universal, not everybody got it. It wasn't just on, on Facebook. In fact, if you went on the, on the page before they deactivated, it only had like 300,000 um, uh, people out of a voting population of 19 million. There were 19 million registered voters in Kenya in 2017. And it was being spread on WhatsApp in what we call, what I would call, uh, WhatsApp is what we call dark social that you, you can't see people's connections, but it generates web traffic, right? So it's spreading on, on dark social within people's networks, within people's networks. Again, the regulator is not able to see that. Again, the regulator is not able to intervene on that. What do people do with political information like this once they get it? That then becomes the problem. Number one, if we're not all reading from the same script, should we all be voting in the same election? If we're not all, all, meaning, if we're not all operating from the same baseline, even if we don't agree on what the information, if we, even if we don't agree, but the baseline information is the same. For example, that we all want better schools, that the schools are not running well. And you say, well, the schools are not running well because the teachers aren't being paid enough. And someone else says, well, the schools are not running well because um, we need private education, right? The baseline information is the same. We're disagreeing with what to do with it. What we're seeing with this impact of money and advertising is the baseline information is not the same. And you can't argue, you can't, I think you can't have constructive political discourse if people can't even agree on the baseline issues. What you end up with is identity-driven politics. And identity-driven politics, you can't argue identity. I can't argue that my ethnic group is superior to yours. I mean, I can try, but Fundamentally, that is something that is, is just down to everybody's lived experiences, right? And what happens after that? What happens when people instrumentalize these ident identity differences? What happens when identity politics becomes instrumentalized uh, in the political space? For us, it means individuals spending money to mobilize their individual identity groups to violence, to more political um, what you, push and pull. Um, and I think these are things that if we had been paying more attention to what was happening in countries like Kenya, um, Nigeria, and, no, and, and I, I really have to underscore this, I'm not saying that these things only matter because they might eventually affect the West. I think that they matter in their own sphere. But what I'm really trying to do in this book is to speak against the idea that African politics or politics in a specific African country happens in a bubble that is somehow disconnected from the rest of the world. That's really the point that I'm trying to make here is that we are all connected and African politics it does not necessarily suffer from pathologies that are so fundamentally different from the pathologies of the West that there's nothing to be learned from paying attention across the lines that we've drawn in, each, in, in our political lives. Um, so that's a very long-winded way of saying. Um, what I tried to do in that chapter about, I call it digital colonialism, um, is to really underscore that money, the impact of money in the political process is broadly detrimental um, we can no longer just believe that one person, one vote, one vote is the truth because of the extent to which our preferences, our political preferences and our political behavior is being shaped by the sociology of these platforms. We, can't, we can no longer pretend that 
these things are mutual and we have to understand it before it gets out of control. So the book is about those, the kind of negative side of the misinformation of those platforms. But I think what's also really refreshing about the book is that it's very much about the agency of ordinary mm. Kenyans using um, technologies to build collective identities, make uh, collective demands. So I wanted to ask you to come to that and to give us some of those examples of how Kenyans have used information technology to shift entrenched views, to challenge orthodoxies and, and make meaningful change. Sure. Um, it was very important for me to do that. It was very important for me to bring the agency of Kenyan people to the forefront of this conversation, um, not as passive, you know, pushing back against this whole narrative that technology happens to Africans. They are not shape. They don't shape it. They don't influence it. They don't. It's just the things land from outside, and then you know, you know the. Sorry, I shouldn't. That, but you know that film, The Gods Must Be Crazy. You guys didn't see that film. It's a great. Is it a great film? <laughs> it's a film. Um, but there's a scene where there's a Coca-Cola bottle that lands. You, people who have watched it know what I'm talking about. Um, but that's the, 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 the conversation on tech that I think is, is dominant right now, is that it's, tech is the Coca-Cola bottle that lands and people then have to reorganize the societies around, around it. Um, and I try to move away from that. I think we've seen tremendous displays of agency um, and tremendous displays of organizing that are challenging orthodoxies about who Kenya is and what Kenya should look like moving forward. Um, I'm really impressed by what radical feminists are doing online because radical feminism is a discourse that does not have space in the traditional public sphere in Kenya. Um, whether it's organizing fundraising for a lady who has been a, a victim of a violent assault by her partner um, or a, a, a young woman who has also been the victim of a similar attack, or it's organizing against the constitutionality of the parliament, right? And we're seeing movements, conversations that are being started online that are pushing back on political behavior offline. Um, I'm really impressed by what the gender and sexual minorities in Kenya are doing um, by staking a claim in the public sphere. Um, beginning off online and doing it in such a way that they cannot be ignored offline. So um, I don't know how many of you follow the Rafiki conversation about the film that was banned. Um, you know, the censor said these are not African values. And then what happened actually was that the filmmaker went online, but also offline, right? They sued the censor and then went online and mobilized people. And so the court decided that they were going to issue an injunction on the censoring and allowed um, the film to be screened in Kenya for one week and it became the most popular film screened in Kenya in 2018. And that sold out screen after screen after screen after screen after screen primarily because of the online conversation. It wasn't because, because the censor had made it impossible for the offline conversation to reflect that. That is people staking a claim in their national identity that would otherwise not be seen. Um, we're seeing new ways of being and belonging. We're seeing um, communities of concern being built that transcend ethnic um, boundaries. And a lot of this has to do with fundraising for people who are ill, people who are um, you know, uh, in incapacitated, people who are unable to find work. Um, and you have to keep these things in perspective, right? Because it's actually a huge problem for people to be going on Twitter to say, I have a first class honors degree from X university and I'm not able to find work. That's a systemic problem. But when you see people rallying around these people, that's also a sign of something else, right? Because it's writing against this idea that Kenyans are fundamentally um, ethnic, Political, politically we are fundamentally ethnic and we only respond to the concerns of people within our ethnic spaces. And this happens like on a daily basis. Um, so it's really finding these spaces for agency, good and bad. And the conversations about how the state itself has as a political actor also has agency. And the people who are building, you know, are also in that, in that conversation. So I'm hoping this is the last question that I ask and that you're all busy formulating your questions, but just in case you need a little more time. 
Um, in the book, you use the terms data parasites mm -hmm. and political technologies, and I wondered if you could just maybe comment on how those terms were useful to you in thinking through these issues. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard this statement. Um, if the product is free, you are the product. Right? Um, really, the product on social media is our data. It's our information. We are not the customers. The customers are the people who turn that data into money. Um, and data parasitism to me is the fact that most people are not aware that this information is being scraped, that it's being turned into something else. Most people don't go online with the intent of being profiled of having ghost profiles. By the way, did you know that, for example, Facebook has profiles created on you even if you don't have a Facebook account? So they use the preferences of people who fit similar criteria and they try and build models off of that in order to help them integrate across platforms. Um, and I have to be honest, right? Like, I love, and, and Tony knows this, I love social media. Um, so it's very difficult for me to be entirely... Uh, like, uh, negative, right? Because I see all of the good things that it's doing and it's allowed people to do, but at the same time, we have to be conscious of the fact that there are things that are happening on the platform that are you know, like a parasite, like a tapeworm, you know, feeding off of things that you're doing for another reason. Um, I think I speak a lot about um, predators, you know, and the fact that many of the people who would spend money, of the companies that would spend money on this, they're people who are doing good work with the data that they're getting from social media. They're people who are building very uh, good studies, for example, um, based on, but they have to go through, um, what are they called, the, the IRB, IRB? The, the ethics, you know, yeah, ethics, ethics boards and ethics yeah. conversations, but there are a lot of studies that are being built off of that information yeah. that are trying to understand very important questions. The thing is, on the other hand, who has the most money to spend on a study of 47,000 people, like what Cambridge Analytica did in Kenya in 2011? They did a study, a lot of it was text-based, but they, they sampled 47, I think, Honestly, outside for the demographic and health surveys and the census, it's one of the largest surveys that I've ever seen administered in Kenya. And nobody knew about it until after the election. And, and so um, these are the kind of things that I'm thinking about. And I, I like to think at a very system, systemic, systems level, um, which is what happens when you don't get rid of a parasite early enough? What happens if we don't understand what this thing is doing to the political system early enough? Um, we got by, and this is why I leave it in Kenya, we got by, I think in part because this was a British company that does not understand the nuances of identity politics in Kenya. And I give this example in the book that um, ethnicity is the main political uh, is one of the main pol political identities that is in play in Kenya. It correlates to things that you wouldn't even expect. And it's not a perfect correlation. So which football team you support? Which um, town you live from, you, li you, li you come from? Your surname. I have a surname that actually does not, co is, is, diff is completely, nobody else in my ethnic group other than my family, I think, has the surname. Right, which is a reflection of our unique history. Um, you wouldn't know that if you didn't understand how Kenya worked. Um, so that's why I think we got by in 2017. We have an election coming down in 2022. It's gonna be more competitive, more money, more voters. Everything's gonna be ratcheted up a little bit more. Have we taken the time to understand and learn from this first digital decade? Je ne sais pas. <laughs> Okay, questions. Have I answered all your questions? Oh my God. I've answered all your questions. Great. <laughs> no one wants
want to see that everybody wants to get that one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, first question. Um, thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, I actually used to work in advertising mm. um, straight off to university. Mm. So I spent th nearly three years booking, buying and planning mm. advertisements mm. <laughs> with no idea or concept of the implications. Um, mm. and most of our clients were you know, selling deodorant or gym memberships or holidays mm. and the consequences of, of uh, what we were doing with data never really seemed to apply. Mm. Um, and then an account we took on was actually for the Labour Party in this country. Yeah. Um, and I suddenly started to think about <laughs> what we were doing with people's yeah. data and now I'm here. Mm. Um, I, I would say that there's, there's a disconnect in communication between the everyday planners mm. who have n no concept of, uh, uh, you know, internationally what, 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 where data is being used, where it's coming from. and um, you know, from spending nearly three years in that world, mm. there was there was no no concept of implication. Mm. Um, I wonder whether in, in your book whether there's a section on you know how we can try and link communication and how for people who are just working in advertising in a day to day context and that's their job, mm. how, how are those everyday planners like I was? Mm you know, uh, how, are, how are they going to understand that? Yeah. Sure. Um, do you want to answer that or do we take three? Uh, can we take, take a couple back here? Oh. Anyone else? Thank you a lot for, <coughs> for this very interesting presentation. Mm. We haven't gone through the book, obviously, mm. <laughs> but I'm very interested in the, the interactions between, I mean, as you mentioned, between new technologies and identities as mm. they are, ethnic mm. identities mm. or clan or group mm. identity. How much, because you've been mentioning them, mm. the concept of agency, uh, the kind of uh, being instrumentalized by social media, how much is technology changing identities in the sense that is challenging or is reproducing or challenging this kind of, we would say traditional or old, though we know that this, these terms come with, the, with, the, with constraints, but the idea is that how much is shaping new identities where people mix at different levels, not because of their, their family name. Yeah, sure. Should I just answer those two? Yeah. Um, with regards to, I mean, I don't really, oh, um, can I answer these two and then take yours? Well, you can take yours. <laughs> um, thank you for your presentation. Mm -hmm. um, I will be short. I just want to know if uh, your study showed that there is an effect uh, on the ages. So most of the time, some youth, or mm. most of the youth, they don't have that identity that their parents have, mm. talking about ethnicity. Mm. So um, is the result are different, whatever people are youth or not? Mm. Okay, that's a great question. Okay, um, so on the advertising question, I don't really go into the details about advertising. Um, there are so many things. One, I, I was thinking to me before, one of the best questions that I got at one of these presentations was, what didn't you put in the book? And then I ended up rattling off like six different things. There's so many different directions that I could have gone on some of these issues. So I don't go into it as much detail as I would like to. I recommend the work of Zainab Tefeki. Um, she wrote Twitter and Tear Gas, but she's also doing a lot of work on YouTube because YouTube is where you really start to see how um, algorithms and advertising and YouTube and Facebook are the worst culprits for this um, shape human behavior and, and children especially, how baby YouTube is incredible. By the way, don't ever let your children watch YouTube unsupervised. It's actually really terrible. Um, and so, but I would say overall, I think we just need more humanities in, we've been doing this whole STEM, 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 STEM thing. And I'd say business is a close second, you know, and, and, and it's affiliated sort of outshoots of which I would consider advertising to be one. I think we just need to have more humanities in, in these conversations and to really have a more human-centered approach to, to these things. We, you know, Google tells us first do no harm and we think, oh, that's fine. They said first do no harm and they have ice cream breaks and so they must be fine. Um, and so we stop interrogating what it is that's happening behind that. Um, 
when Free Basics, which is Facebook's free internet platform, was announced um, for the developing world, there was this whole internet.org. It's a .org, man. Of course, it's, it's good. It's doing good things. And then we started to have the real critical questions coming out. And they started actually in India, but came over to Africa eventually, which was, what does it mean to have a two-tiered internet in a country where class is a central political um, tool? What does it mean to do that? And, and I think it's making space for these kinds of critical conversations in the tech conversation, that, um, in the advertising conversation. Um, Incidentally, the advertising conversation is something that's happened. We've been discussing it in Kenya with, to do with local language radio because the fragmentation of radio from two, we only had English and Kiswahili service for a long time and then we liberalized the airwaves. And now you have 178 radio stations in Kenya. Many are broadcasting in languages that the regulator does not have the capacity to monitor. And a lot of that has to do with advertising. And, um, Local language radio was the main culprit in this incitement um, to do with the 2007 election. In Rwanda, it was pre the advertising, but Mil Kolin, the radio station that spread the most anti-Tutsi messaging, was only in existence for about a year and a half before the genocide. So there is a conversation that, needs, that has, with other forms of communication, that's happened with radio, it's happened with television in the 50s and 60s, it's happened with uh, print media. What we don't have is a genealogy of these conversations so that people can actually learn instead of starting again every time a new type of communications platform um, is created. Um, how, yeah, I do go into some detail about how um, the tech is changing the identity conversation in Kenya. And some of it's quite good. Like people are able to publicly identify with causes that are being driven by people who are different from them. And because a lot of what's happening online is a Nairobi conversation, and I'm very clear about this from the beginning. 79% of all Twitter accounts in Kenya are run from Nairobi, um, or people are tweeting in English especially. Um, so it's a certain type of person who is online. But the fact that this certain type of person then gets the high level visibility, then gets to be able to um, amplify, they get amplified through the traditional media, there is, we're seeing some kind of, of transformation. Hearing more from people who are um, would be considered ethnic minorities for, in Kenyan terms. You know, seeing people who are, when I, whenever I tell people I'm from Kenya, especially when I come to the UK, but also in the US, the question that usually, for someone who knows something about Kenyan politics is, are you Kikuyu? And everybody thinks Kenyans are either Kikuyu or Luo, because those are the ethnic identities that dominate the political discourse. But there are 44 ethnic groups in Kenya. And the fact that we're seeing more of these 42 other ethnic groups being more visible, maybe I'd say 41, because Kalenjins tend, because of the former president, um, tend to also get a lot of airtime. Um, religious groups, religious identities, you know, people having, the, one of the most famous Instagram models in Kenya right now is a religion we call Akurino, which is an indigenous religion, um, indigenous interpretation of Christianity that involves um, women, both men and women, wearing um, head wraps, white head wraps. Uh, but then she dresses in modern fashion, you know, from the waist down, from the neck down. And she's created a niche for herself on Instagram and has a fan base of people who are outside the bounds of her religion. So there's some kind of energy that's happening there that's, to me, changing the identity conversation. I don't know if it's fundamental enough in the context of the challenge. And if you had asked me this before the 2017 election, I might have given you a different answer. But what we saw in the 2017 election was the coarsening of the more ugly um, conversation, in part because of what I mentioned before, the influence of money and advertising and PR and messaging, surreptitious messaging that reinforces ethnic difference as opposed to ethnic similarities. Um, and this goes to the question about age and demographics as well. Um, if you would have asked me before 2017, I might have given you a different answer. But one of the things that I point out repeatedly in the book is 
states also have, as political actors, have agency and they learn. And in 2013, the state might have been trying to catch up with what people were doing online. Now they're caught up and they're trying to get a step ahead of the people. And the reason why ethnic identities, I go into a long conversation in the book about why I think ethnic identities are such a potent political concept, is because they, they really only exist in our minds. It's not tied to anything biological. It's not tied to anything physical. It's a creation that we use to allow other types of mostly trust of social interactions to happen. So um, I was really disappointed as a Kenyan to see young people who had no reason to embrace these kinds of toxic conversations, embrace them with the intention of, yeah, I, I, if you would have asked me in 2017, I might have been a little bit more optimistic on this point. But at this particular point, I think that the, the journey to change the, that conversation is much longer than I think we were ready for. Um, so the people who are changing, but Kenya's population has gone up by 10 million over the last 12 years. That's the estimate. We have a census coming up this year. Every day there's like another 100,000 people who come of age. And I just don't know if we're reaching enough of them for things to be different. I don't know if I'm answering your question. This is, a, this is also having, a, this is a lot of internal stuff. <laughs> um, but anyway. Other questions? Hmm. No. Thanks very much. Hi. Mm. Of course, we've all become aware in the UK and the US mm. um, of the interference of Facebook and others in elections. Mm. What What are the lessons we can draw from Kenya for Western, more what I call declining democracies rather than mm. mature democracies? Mm. It's OK. I got it. Thanks. Um, Anyone else, or shall I just answer that? This is a great audience. I'm going to take you guys everywhere. Um, what are the lessons from Kenya? Um, number one, I think, is to take the threat seriously <coughs> before it gets out of control, um, is to pay attention to the conversations that are happening online, um, is to not be dismissive of threats because they're coming from our people. Um, there has been so much investment, for example, in the US to understanding Islamic, um, what they call Islamic terrorism, and no attention at all given to domestic homegrown white terrorism. And now who is turning out to be the bigger problem? More radicalized young white men kill more Americans than any other group. Um, and a lot of that starts from the conversations that they're having online. So it's to pay more attention to what's happening online. With us, it was um, one of the things that, again, didn't make it into the book that I really want to spend more time thinking about is um, police officers who run Facebook groups with hit lists. So they are these neighborhood watch communities, especially in, in an area of Nairobi we would call Eastlands. Um, which is a really big area, a uh, working class uh, neighborhoods, and they have these neighborhood watch groups whereby people um, would report crime, would report petty thefts and things like that. And then they bring in a police officer from the local police station who's supposed to be like some kind of liaison. But what ends up happening is someone reports a crime or an, accuses someone of a crime, and a police officer puts a picture up of a young man, usually a young man, sometimes a young woman, and says, if you don't change your ways in the next two weeks, I'm going to kill you. And then we don't pay attention to that, and in two weeks, he puts up a picture of the dead young man. 
And um, this has been happening in Kenya for the last, I would say, four or five years. But it all culminated around the election period because the police were actually just going door to door and picking off um, young men especially, poor young men especially. It's, a, it's now embedded practice in some of the police stations um, in Eastlands. Pangani comes to mind. Um, and there is no way of reining that in now. I mean, there probably is, but right now everybody's kind of stuck because it's become so embedded in policing practice um, that we don't know what to do with it. So it's to pay attention to what's happening online before it gets out of control and to give it the attention that it deserves. Um, and to protect politics from money, which seems like a really difficult thing to be proposing in 2019. Um, but we have to do more to protect politics from money um, and the influence of money that and I guess this is a philosophical, right? It's a philosophical, metaphysical conversation about global capitalism and, and the fact that a British PR firm did most of the messaging for a Kenyan political party. And their main, you know, the main outcome from that big survey was that Kenyans are very hostile to outsiders. And therefore, your main messaging should be, you know, protect. That. And if you look at the messaging around the ICC indictments, that's how they won. That's how both the Jubilee. Um, that's the, how the coalition won, that they kept saying that the ICC was a tool of the West that's coming to Kenya to colonize Kenya, da, 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 and that's how they won. So there's something really perverse about that, right? Um, but it is global capital. It is British capital that is shaping the Kenyan political behavior. Um, it is British capital, it's American capital now that's influencing British political uh, behavior. Um, and it's going to keep, it's going to, keep, you know, it's going to be Russian capital that's going to affect X, Y, Z. It's going to be Turkish capital that's going to shape elections in Virginia because Gulen Fatsa is in, is in Virginia. There's going to be a lot of that happening now. And if we don't figure this climate out soon, our election, our 2017 election was determined in London. Our 2017 election was not determined in Kenya, and I stood in line for two hours to vote, and I know that my vote didn't count for anything. Um, I guess some of you would feel the same way um, about how the Brexit vote went down. I think I know Americans definitely feel the same way about how the Trump election went down. This is our new normal because we haven't given enough time to think about what the role of money is in our electoral process. The DRC election was not determined in the DRC. Um, so things like that. But I do have a number of, of things that I point out. Thank you. Thank you for your question. The last question? Yeah, me. Okay. <laughs> one more. Um, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, so my question is, I don't know. It's not on, but I can hear you. Okay, sure. Uh, so the question is, uh, is there any positive uh, policies or outcomes that have resulted from the use of social media or mobile phones in terms of policies that affect normal Kenyans all over or just a specific group of Kenyans? Mm -hmm. Should I take the next one? Yeah, it's okay. I got it. Should we take the next one too? Yeah. Mm. No, no, go ahead. No, so my question was, um, as people who work in uh, academia, mm. one of the problems I think we always have with uh, studying, working on digital issues, that we're, we're like far, always five years behind. Mm -hmm. We're just kind of, oh, look, it's a CD-ROM. The, the kind of pace of uh, keeping up with digital technologies is really, um, can be kind of really glacial in academia. If you were... What, what would you like to see academic focus on, especially in kind of policy orientated institutions like IDS? Okay. Where, where should we be fixing our, our glare? Okay. Oh, that's a nice question. Um, yeah, it might seem that there's only a, a, a negatives here because we've kind of, um, we've 
this is basically two conversations, right? So we're in the second half of our, of our conversation. We, we had all the positives um, before, but there's a, a real amount of positive um, that's happened. Um, I'll give you just one example off the top of my head. One of my favorite examples is what we ended up calling the Kenya KOT um, Electoral Observer Mission, which was basically that one of the reasons why it was the, the fraud that happened in the 2017 election, the August iteration was so well documented was that people went to their polling stations and they took pictures because you know you vote, you vote, you vote, and then all the agents agree, they count the count, all the agents agree that this is what the town it was, they fill the form, and one copy of the form has to be posted at the polling station and then the other, uh, the electronic results are transmitted to the National Tallying Center. And when the results started to come in online, people started to say, wait, hang on a second, that wasn't what was announced on my polling station. That's not what came out on my polling station. That's not da da da. And so they started to go to their polling stations and take pictures of the discrepancies and post and say, wait a second, this is what the website is saying, but this is not what was happening on the ground. And this is one of the Really, it's a fantastic example of citizen agency and, and people independently documenting electoral fraud to challenge the official narrative. And indeed, when the case was in court, the IEBC itself disavowed the electoral results. The Chief Justice asked them what were they, and they said they were just statistics. Um, we, we've seen it with the elections. We've seen it with election violence as well. Um, on August 11th, the 9 p.m., um, the IBC announced that Uhuru Kenyatta had won the election. The shooting, I was in Nairobi, the shooting began almost immediately. Um, and there was a four day blackout, news blackout, because the local media was not able, was not allowed to, was not willing to, whatever you want to ask, to go and cover this violence. The international media was broadcasting out, right? Not, the Wall Street Journal does not publish for a Kenyan audience primarily. It was individuals, citizens, documenting what was happening in their local community. That's the reason why we know about the death of baby Samantha Pando that eventually got to the point where the local media could not ignore it anymore. You heard of the hashtag, if you were following the Kenyan election, you heard of the hashtag, Luo Lives Matter. That was citizens saying, just because you are censoring the traditional media doesn't mean you're going to censor us completely, and documenting and going up and writing and, and writing against the official censored narrative. There have been so many amazing demonstrations of citizen agency and people op in operationalizing the internet and social media to tell stories that need to be told and to build new ways of thinking about their identity as Kenyans. Um, I'd like to give the example of Bobby Wine, Free Bobby Wine. 67% of the tweets that came out in support of Free Bobby Wine came from Kenya. Um, you think about the Profiteers, which is a South Sudan um, there's a documentary that was made about how senior officials of the South Sudanese government were profiteering basically off of the conflict and that a lot of that money was going through Kenya and Uganda. And one hour before the broadcast, it was supposed to go on Sunday television, which is prime time, one hour before the broadcast, the broadcaster pulled the show and said, you can't air this you know, because of you know, so-and-so higher up in the food chain. So what did they do? They organized the screening in Nairobi. They put the documentary on YouTube and because of the virality of the hashtag in Kenya, people in South Sudan saw the documentary and it was impossible for the South Sudanese senior administration, many of whom go back and forth between Nairobi and Juba, to ignore the conversation and people, people did get fired, right? So there is a lot of really cool stuff. I love the movements that are being built online. I love the transnationalism of the movements that are being built online, that we are hearing about Sudan and we're hearing about Togo and we're hearing about because all of these places because the news that we get in Kenya about news that Africans get about other African countries is normally filtered through Europe right if I want to know what's happening in Togo I have to go to France 24 I have to go to you know the BBC or whatever but now I can just follow a bunch of people in Togo on Twitter on Facebook or WhatsApp or whatever and I can learn from them what's happening um, in their country. There's so much cool stuff that's happening online. I think it's really more that um, we're at a decision point where we have to decide if we're going to incubate the positive or incubate the negative. And um, 
to, do, to make that decision, we have to be suitably aware of the risks that come with the negative. Um, what should the focus be on? Ooh. Um, hmm. That's a really interesting question. I would love to see more human elements being brought into this conversation. I would love to see, you know, when you look at the um, annual reports for these groups, I had to look at the annual reports from Facebook and, and Twitter, and, and you see that they don't really, Twitter has an interesting way of measuring success, mostly because they haven't made any money. Twitter's never made any money. Um, so the way they present their annual reports is all about how impact and whatever. But they're all very abstract. There's very little actual human beings represented. And I would love to see researchers hold these companies to task, especially on behalf of people in societies like mine. You know, when the British government got angry at Facebook, they summoned them to come to testify. Uh, Brussels, they ignored them, but they came. They summoned them. Singapore did the same. They had to go and testify in DC. When the news of Cambridge Analytica broke, the Kenyan government shrugged. I said, okay, what are you gonna do with this information? Nothing, because we are not, again, living in a representative democracy. So I would love for research to really create that space for people to have more of these conversations and to really look at how technology both absolves states of their democratic obligations, but also, as I've just mentioned, creates opportunities for people to do that. And not in a deterministic way. More tech isn't necessarily a good thing. Let's ask complicated questions. Let's not resist complicated narratives. That's what I would love to see. Um, and I hope this is a jumping off point for some of those conversations. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Is there any more questions? Yes, I oh. oh, there Final is. Final question, and then back here we'll wrap up. I have a question and a kind of a reflection. So mm. the, the question is partly around, you talked about studying work, the, the words in mm. the text, mm. but I think there's also, some, but you also mentioned YouTube mm. and, and Instagram. And I think when, I just think there's something interesting in terms of study and, and kind of noticing how much that this is a kind of, the digital world constantly eludes us in different ways. And one <laughs> of the ways it's eluding analysis now is that it's high it's far more visual mm -hmm. than text than it than text based mm. and that, that's uh, you know instagram is the is the thing mm. uh, and kids are watching youtube rather than tv and i wonder what if you have any reflections on how how do we watch <laughs> how do we <laughs> watch pun, the how do we watch that because that it, you know in those visual in that v visual language can pick up so many more of those cues yeah that um that activate people's fears or yeah. uh, kind of identities. So that's that's the question, but I also wanted to, there's a bigger reflection where around, so uh, I was listening to the uh, radio show this morning, which was quite connected to this, mm. and they were using the term surveillance capitalism. Oh yeah. And so I'd probably, I just want to push, say, say there's some pushing we could do, which says, well, maybe the Kenyan government is not worried about the surveillance, because maybe actually, there's a, there, there are, you know, this is a larger stage, you know, we're moving mm. in terms of the nature of capitalism. Mm. Um, and that maybe there's some reflections there around the way that it's not only advertising and it's not only elections, but it's a bigger question about data capital. Mm. That's a good question. Um, I have a lot of conversation in there about the panopticon that the Kenyan government is building. Um, and I, I, there is an element of data capitalism, right? People turning information into money. And there's definitely an element of, um, yeah, our private information becoming the new commodity and, and tracking and all of that. There's also an element of data as power, right? Like the state's not necessarily interested in making money off of your data. They're really interested in n making you think that they know what you're doing at all times. Um, 
And I love history. Um, and I, I wish I, if I had, if I could go back in time, that's probably something that I would love to spend. I would study history because when colonization happened in Kenya, one of the things that the most visual tools of the colonial project was the kipande, which is a pass that every African man had to wear around their neck. And, and it was racial, right? So if you were in Nairobi and a white man saw a black man and he didn't have his kipande on, he could arrest him, he could beat him, he could do whatever. It was a, it was a conduit to power, right? Um, and my granddad had to wear a kipande because he used to work on the railway. And so the, the idea of a national identity document is inherently racial. It is inherently about power. It is inherently about oppression. And that is why you don't have national identity cards. And that is why almost every British colony does. And that is why Australia said we don't want to have national identity cards because it is all of this baggage. In Kenya, the discourse has been inverted. Now having a national identity card is, a man, is your right. It's your right to be part of this colonial project. It's your right. Women got identity cards in Kenya in 1978. I cannot enter a public building or even a private building without my ID card. I can't open a bank account. I cannot, I cannot, ex I don't exist in Kenya if I don't have an ID, right? And so there's something really fascinating about that that is echoed in this data surveillance power system that we're seeing in Kenya. Because right now, all of that information is linked, it's now digitized, right? It's the KRA tax system, it's the NTSA car system, it's the, and, and now they, last week it was, they want to build one, they want to call it the single source of identity information that has DNA information <coughs> and your physical location, right? And all of this integrated, your tax, the tax man already has my bank account details. Like there's all of this whole thing that's happening that is not necessarily about money per se, but it's about the panopticon. It's about making you feel like they can see you whenever they want to see you so as to control your behavior. Um, and I would say this is maybe one of the other things that we need to, to, to think about systematically as researchers, which is how these narratives and these discourses become inverted over time and, and how they become twisted and, and, and how they become, now this is a good thing, right? Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. The Kenyan government doesn't, isn't mad at the surveillance because what the surveillance does, number one, is that it brings money in because who's paying for all of this stuff? It's the American government. It's the British government who's paying for the surveillance machine because terrorism. Um, they're not mad at it. They're not resisting it. So yeah. Um, how do we watch the visuals? Again, I, I deliberately didn't go down the YouTube route because there's so much YouTube material. I highly recommend Zainab's work. She's building a whole research group actually at Duke, uh, UNC. University of North Carolina around YouTube and all of this stuff because it is really insidious. And again, if you have children, I really, really urge you. I had two small nephews and the first video is always Peppa Pig or whoever. The second video, by the time you get to the fifth, sixth video, it is usually very macabre. It's, it's uh, decapitations, it is, but all of this cutesy na -na 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 voice and it's really dark ugly stuff and my two-year-old nephew is able to navigate YouTube on my brother's iPod before he's able to say complete sentences like before he's able to say <laughs> you know I would like to go potty now he can go on YouTube and unlock the password and go I want to watch these videos so there's something there um, I haven't gone into it, but I would recommend Zainab's work because this is something that she has really tried, is really trying to, to make sense of, um, and I think it's so important. I couldn't believe it when I first saw my nephew do that, and I was just like, I don't know, man. It's, it's gonna be real interesting. Good luck to all of you who have children. Um, <laughs> any other questions? That was amazing. We have a massive round of applause. Thank you. Book is available for the.
the bargain price for nine pounds at the back, together with a code if you want to just go and buy it online. And Amy's got a magic machine, not not a panopticon <laughs> machine, obviously. Um, but thank you so much for coming, and uh, thank you so much to the dancers. Thank you, you great audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I